Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Na Yun, and it is my pleasure to be your MC this morning. The UN Public Service Forum is the world's largest public administration gathering of about 1,000 officials and experts in government, public organizations, and academic institutions from 100 countries around the world. Now in its 12th year, the forum has served to promote and share public policy initiatives among UN member nations. And we are very honored to host this prestigious event here in Korea, which has been recognized for its excellence in public service and e-government. With a theme of innovating governance for sustainable development and well-being of the people, we hope this year's forum will act as a platform for exchanging ideas and promoting cooperation in public policy innovation. And now, I would like to officially begin the 2014 UN Public Service Forum. First, we will have the opening address, for which I'd like to invite Minister Kang Pyeong-kyu of Security and Public Administration of the Republic of Korea the host for this year's forum. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the minister with a big round of applause. Hello. I am the Mahathir Malaysia Chen Chongli. 그리고 세계 각국의 대표단, 공공행정 분야 전문가 여러분, 그리고 내외 귀빈 여러분. 2014년 UN 공공행정 포럼 및 시상식에 참석하신 여러분들을 진심으로 환영합니다. 긴 여정에도 불구하고 함께하신 여러분들의 밝은 모습을 보니 앞으로 4일간의 행사가 성공적으로 진행되리라는 기대감이 듭니다. 잘 아시는 바와 같이 오늘 6월 23일은 UN 공공행정의 날입니다. UN은 2002년 공공행정이 국가 발전의 기본 토대임을 되새기고 공공행정 발전을 위한 회원국들의 실천 의지를 다지기 위해 공공행정의 날을 제정하였습니다. 현대 사회에서 공공행정은 더욱 다양한 역할을 요구받고 있습니다. 공공 서비스에 대한 국민의 기대 수준도 점점 높아져 가고 있습니다. 최근에는 기후, 환경, 에너지, 식량 등 특정 국가의 국경을 넘어서 국제 사회와의 협력을 통해 그 해법을 강구해야만 하는 문제들도 등장하고 있습니다. 이에 부응하여 유엔은 2003년부터 유엔 공공행정 포럼 및 시상을 통해서 공공 부분의 혁신 사례에 대해 시상을 하고 이를 세계 여러 나라와 공유할 수 있는 기회를 마련해 왔습니다. 지난 10여 년간 유엔 공공행정상은 질적으로나 양적으로나 놀랄 만큼 그 위상이 높아졌습니다. 지원 과제의 수가 대폭 늘어났을 뿐만 아니라 그 수준도 함께 상승하여 상을 받기 위한 경쟁이 한층 치열해졌습니다. 특히 올해는 작년보다 수상 기간 숫자가 대폭 줄었습니다. 이 자리를 빌어 이번에 수상하시는 14개국 19개 기관 관계자 여러분께 진심으로 축하의 말씀을 드립니다. 이번 공공행정상 수상을 통해서 공공행정 서비스 개선을 위한 각 기관의 창의적이고 혁신적인 노력들이 세계 여러 나라와 공유되고 참가하신 모든 분들이 급변하는 행정 환경에 효과적으로 대처할 수 있는 역량을 증진시키기, 증진시킬 수 있기를 바랍니다. 내외 귀빈 여러분, 각국의 경제사회 발전 정도에 따라 
혹은 정부의 조직 형태에 따라 공공행정의 형태는 다양할 수 있지만 모든 공공부분의 최종적인 목표는 시민의 삶의 질 향상에 있다고 할수 있을 것입니다. 오늘날 풍요롭고 창조적인 삶을 추구하는 인간 행복이 중요한 가치로 대두되고 있습니다. 지속적이고 안정적인 경제성장 기반 위에 사회통합과 환경보존을 실천하는 지속가능한 발전이 주목받고 있습니다. 이러한 인식을 바탕으로 유엔과 한국은 2014년 유엔 공공행정포럼의 주제를 지속가능 발전과 국민 행복 증진을 위한 거버넌스 혁신으로 설정하였습니다. 이번 포럼을 계기로 전 세계 공공행정이 한 단계 더 도약하고 전 세계인의 삶이 보다 풍요로워질 수 있도록 각국 간의 협력이 증진되기를 바랍니다. 여러분께서도 잘 아시다시피 한국은 전후 최빈국 중에 하나였지만 지난 반세기 동안 한강의 기적이라는 눈부신 경제사회 발전을 통해 국제사회로부터 원조를 받던 나라에서 국제사회에 원조를 주는 나라로 탈바꿈하였습니다. 이제 한국은 사회경제발전의 저력을 바탕을 통해서 공공부분의 혁신을 도모하고 있습니다. 실제로 공공행정과 전자정부 분야에서 선도적인 위치를 차지하고 있습니다. UN 공공행정상 총 25회 수상, UN 전자정부 평가 2회 연속 1위라는 결과만 보아도 한국이 공공행정 분야에 얼마나 많은 관심과 노력을 기울이고 있는지 알수 있을 것입니다. 이러한 한국의 공공행정 발전 경험은 국제사회로부터 많은 주목을 받고 있습니다. 우리 정부는 이러한 요구에 부응하기 위해서 다양한 노력을 기울여 왔습니다. 외국 공무원을 국내로 초청해서 연수를 받게 하거나 우리나라 관련 전문가를 해외로 파견해서 노하우를 전수하고 있습니다. 또한 새마을운동 시범마을, 정보화 마을, 조성지원, 그리고 전자정부 지원 컨설팅 등 우리나라의 성공적인 행정 모델을 개도국과 공유하려는 노력도 병행해 왔습니다. 이번 포럼이 국제사회의 도움으로 성장한 한국의 발전 경험을 세계와 공유하고 지구촌의 공동 번영에 기여할 수 있는 계기가 되기를 바랍니다. 내외 규빈 여러분, 지금 각국 정부는 국민을 위한 정부의 서비스 경쟁력을 높이고 미래를 내다보는 지속가능한 발전을 위해 다양한 노력을 기울이고 있습니다. 그러나 기술의 급속한 발전과 함께 더욱 복잡해지는 경제사회 환경 속에서 그러한 노력들을 가시적인 성과로 이끌어내는 것은 결코 쉬운 일이 아니며 정부가 해결해야 할 문제도 점점 증가하고 있는 실정입니다. 한국도 예외는 아닙니다. 경제 성장률의 저하, 세대 간, 계층 간의 사회 갈등, 저출산과 고령화 등 정부의 힘만으로는 해결하기 어려운 문제에 직면해 있습니다. 이런 문제를 해결하는 데 있어 정부, 즉 공공행정이 큰 역할을 할수 있지만 공급자 중심으로 정부를 운영하는 기존 <웃음> 패러다임으로는 한계가 있습니다. 이에 한국은 공공행정혁신의 해답을 정부 3.0에서 찾고자 합니다. 정부 3.0은 한마디로 국민과 현장 중심으로 정부 운영을 혁신하려는 것입니다. 공공정보를 개방 공유하고 기간 간의 칸막이를 허물고 협업해서 국민 한분한 한 분께 맞춤형 서비스를 제공하는 것입니다. 국민의 시각에서 국민과 한 방향을 바라보고 국민이 원하는 서비스를 선제적으로 제공할 수 있도록 정부의 일하는 방식과 문화를 
혁신하려고 합니다. 국민 중심의 정부로 거듭 태어나기 위해서는 먼저 정부가 가진 정보와 데이터를 투명하게 개방하는 과정이 선행되어야 하며 이것이 정부 3.0의 기본이자 핵심이라고 할수 있습니다. 과거 정부는 국민 생활과 관련된 다양한 정보를 보유하고 있었음에도 정보를 국민들에게 공개하는 데는 인색해서 국민들은 쉽게 정보를 얻을 수 없었습니다. 그러나 3.0을 통해서 정보 공개의 패러다임을 획기적으로 전환해 국민이 필요로 하는 정보를 사전에 공개할 수 있게 하였고 비공개가 아닌 문서는 원문까지 공개하도록 하였습니다. 아울러 정부가 보유한 공공 데이터를 민간에 대폭 개방해서 다양한 일자리와 비즈니스를 창출할 수 있도록 하고 있습니다. 대학생이나 벤처기업은 공공 데이터와 창의적 아이디어를 결합해서 새로운 서비스를 만들어내고 있습니다. 민간이 원하는 데이터가 무엇인지 현장에서 그 수요를 파악하고 이를 직접 개방해서 청년 창업과 고용 창출이 이루어지도록 지원하고 있습니다. 정부 기관 간의 원활한 의사소통과 정보 공유도 매우 중요합니다. 정부가 직면한 사회 문제의 대부분은 어느 한 기관의 힘만으로 해결할 수 있는 것이 아닙니다. 관련된 모든 기관들이 정보를 공유하고 칸막이를 없애야 국민들에게 꼭 필요한 맞춤형 서비스를 제공할 수 있습니다. 궁극적으로 공공행정의 결과물은 국민들에 대한 서비스로 나타나는데 그 종류가 매우 다양합니다. 하지만 수요자인 국민은 본인이 받을 수 있는 서비스가 무엇인지 잘 알지 못하는 경우가 많습니다. 국민이 중심이 되는 정부가 되기 위해서 공공서비스의 문턱을 낮추고 국민이 받을 수 있는 서비스를 생애 주기별로 특성별로 알려주고 신청까지 할수 있도록 서비스 전달 체계를 정비해 나갈 것입니다. 국민이 원하고 필요로 하는 서비스를 미리 미리 알아서 제공하는 비서와 같은 정부, 국민을 따뜻하게 보듬어주는 든든한 정부, 이 모든 것이 정부 3.0을 통해서 이루고자 하는 정부의 모습입니다. 이처럼 대한민국은 정부 3.0 실현을 통해서 공공행정 혁신을 이끌어내는데 모든 역량을 집중하고 있습니다. 한국의 정부 혁신 추진 경험이 이번 포럼 전반에 걸쳐 심도 깊게 논의되고 또전 세계와 널리 공유되기를 바랍니다. 아울러 여러분들의 국가에서 추진한 우수 사례도 귀 기울여, 귀 기울여 듣고 배워 나가겠습니다. 존경하는 내외 기빈 여러분, 한국 정부는 이번 공공행정 포럼을 준비하면서 어떻게 하면 우리 발전 경험과 노하우를 함께 나눌 수 있을지 많이 고민하고 준비해 왔습니다. 한국은 특히 그간 이룩한 각종 행정혁신 사례들과 유엔 평가에서 2회 연속 1위를 차지한 전자정부 그리고 1970년대 한국 경제 발전의 원동력으로 평가받는 주민 주도형 지역 개발 모델인 새마을 운동에 대한 경험을 여러분들과 공유할 수 있는 시간을 포럼 프로그램에 반영했습니다. 또한 행정 혁신에 관한 논의가 이론적 접근에만 그치지 않고 여러분에게 실질적인 이해와 도움이 될수 있도록 각 기관의 우수 사례 전시회를 마련했습니다. 실제로 현장에서 적용되고 있는 모습을 직접 둘러볼 수 있는 스터디 투어도 함께 준비했습니다. 아무쪼록 이번 포럼을 통해 수요자인 국민들의 삶에 큰 도움이 되고 국민 편익을 증진시킬 수 있는 영감과 추동력을 채워갈 수 있기를 고대합니다.
이번 유엔 공공행정포럼 주최 기관장으로서 여러분 모두에게 한국에서의 체류가 즐겁고 기억에 남는 시간이 되기를 바라면서 개회사를 마치고자 합니다. 대단히 감사합니다. Thank you very much, Minister Kang. And next, we have a welcome speech by UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon. The speech will be read by Mr. John Mary Kauzia from the UN Secretariat. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please applaud Mr. John Mary Kauzia from the UN Secretariat. Excellences, ministers, distinguished guests, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be here to deliver the following message from the Secretary General of the United Nations. The annual observance of Public Service Day highlights the invariable contributions of the public servants and administrators in our efforts to build a better world for all. At a time of complex and interdependent global challenges, effective governance and efficient public administration are central to meeting our development goals. They will also be vital for implementing the post-2015 development agenda. At today's commemoration in Seoul, the United Nations will recognize 19 public institutions from 14 countries for their outstanding achievements. The winners and finalists come from different regions and different levels of development. But what they have in common is having overcome complex challenges through innovative public service. They have revitalized education for the marginalized, enhanced transparency and accountability, supported environmental protection, and deployed technology to increase the efficiency of health and water services. These trailblazing efforts have resulted in greater equity and inclusion in the delivery of public services in their communities. I congratulate these institutions for their dedication to excellence. I encourage all who work in public service to learn from them and take inspiration from their successes. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the message from the Secretary General of the United Nations. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kauzia, and for delivering Mr. Pan Ki-moon's message. Thank you very much. Next, we have the keynote speeches under the subject, Innovating Governance for Sustainable Development, Imperatives and Strategies. Mr. Yun Sun Ku, the head of 2014 UNPS Forum Preparatory Secretariat, will introduce Dr. Mahathir Mohamed. It's my honor to stand here today and introduce Tun Dr. Mahathir bin Mohamed, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia. Dr. Mahathir held his position as Prime Minister for 22 years 
from 1981 to 2003. During his premiership, he implemented policies that pushed the spectrum of what a country can achieve, making Malaysia what it is today. To become a fully developed country by 2020, Dr. Mati drew a bigger picture with a vision 2020 plan, expecting to mature the society in all aspects. He once jokingly said, quote, I'll be around to be blamed should we fail to meet the vision 2020 goals. But Dr. Mati, year 2020 is just around the corner. And at age 90, you are still strong and healthy. And you can see Dr. Martyr's audacity has allowed Malaysia to build the foundation to overcome today's challenges and continue to achieve economic and political development. Now, please welcome Tun Dr. Martyr Mohamed to the stage. His, His Excellency, with Mr. Kam Byung Kyu, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to say thank you to the UN Service Forum for this invitation to speak on a subject that is of interest to my own country. That is on innovating governance for sustainable development, imperatives and strategies, Malaysia's experience. <clears throat> I think the Koreans should be taking my place here because the Koreans have got a great experience in the field of innovation and they are now the first among the uh, area Korea public service and e-government. That is why very early, way back in 1982, we decided in Malaysia to look east. We decided to look east because we saw the east recovering from a dis disastrous war and rebuilding their country very, very quickly. We thought that we could learn a lot from the East, especially from Korea and Japan and China. And we found that we were not too wrong. We hope that by looking at others, we can learn a lot and not try to reinvent the wheel. Now, reinventing the wheel, of course, is a wasteful project. But there can be improvements made to the wheel so that it would function much better. It's the same with government. We were colonized by the British before, and when we became independent, we inherited a British system of government. Now that system was basic because the British colonial government was only interested in keeping law and order. They were not dedicated to developing the country or solving some of the social problems that were faced by the people. They saw Malaysia as a place to extract possible wealth through plantations, rubber plantations and tin mining. Beyond that, there was no effort made to develop Malaysia. Now, an independent government cannot accept fully all the strategies and policies of a colonial government. When we became independent, we wanted to do things for our people and our country. We have not forgotten the fact that a government is about keeping law and order, of course, but also creating a better life for the people and developing the country. In order to do this, we had to look around to see what other people are doing and to 
except some changes which have already been innovated or carried out in other countries, but also to innovate by ourselves. Now, this is something that was new to us because we had never had the experience of running the country by ourselves. Nevertheless, the early leaders of Malaysia realized that if the country is to remain stable, it must solve the problem of unemployment, the problem of poverty. At the time of independence, 70% of the people were living below the poverty line. We need to do something for them. And so we decided that since we were fairly good in terms of plantation development, we decided to create a body that will open up new land for plantations and to settle on them pioneers, people who were jobless and who were keen to work in plantations. That solved the problem of unemployment partly. Now, agriculture does not create enough jobs per square mile or per, per acre. Agriculture, one, one acre of land, agriculture might supply enough for one person. But we need to find work for a lot more people. And we did not have enough land to open up. And so we decided to industrialize. Now, for a developing country with no technological know-how, no capital, no management skill, and no understanding of the world market, trying to industrialize was something very difficult to tackle. And so we decided that we should invite foreign investors to come to Malaysia and set up labor-intensive industries. Now, that is very important because we were not interested in making money from the investment, but, also, but we were most keen to have more jobs for our people. Now, on one acre of land, you can have as many as 500 jobs in a plant producing whatever. And so, despite the fact that many in newly independent countries were reluctant to invite foreigners, especially their former colonial masters, to come back to the country, we decided to go against the trend, and we decided that it would be good for them to come back and invest in uh, manufacturing plants, provided they do not get involved in local politics. It was very successful. We created more jobs than there were uh, people, uh, workers in Malaysia. The success was such that uh, we had to allow foreign workers to come into our country. Now, a developing country normally doesn't attract foreign workers, but this policy of for direct foreign investment in industry, industry especially for labor creation, is a very good move because it creates jobs and the jobs, after we have given our people all the jobs, we had to allow foreign workers to come in. And so, Malaysia became industrialized. Uh, of course, not all the plants belong to Malaysians, but nevertheless, we learned a lot from the industrialization process, and eventually, Malaysians were able to start their own industries. So Malaysia, which was once an agricultural country, began to export 80% of manufactured goods as against 20% of uh, raw materials such as uh, rubber, tin, palm oil, and uh, petroleum. That made up only 20% of the total exports of Malaysia. So obviously, there has been a transformation in terms of uh, the country's basic, basic economy, economy. But, of course, we cannot go on in the same way without 
trying to do more for the country because our people as laborers, as workers in the factories did not earn enough money. Of course, they were not skillful people. They were just learning. But eventually, many of them became very skillful and they began to earn more income. But still, that was not good enough for the country. So the government decided that we must upgrade the quality of work that is to be done by our country. At that time, we noticed that there was a lot of uh, new uh, implements for, for manufacturing. We saw the introdu introduction of robots and automated uh, manufacturing, which of course reduced the number of workers, which is not something that we worry about because uh, most of the foreign workers would have to lose their jobs. But uh, Malaysian workers became adept in running automated plants, and this required extra skill, better training, but, and therefore they were able to earn more money for themselves. Today, much of the plants are automated, and as a result, we, we have uh, created employment for most of our people, which in turn, uh, well, helps the government to acquire a bigger treasury. We had more money, and we realized that if we are going to develop our country, we have to have the necessary infrastructure. So having enriched the country through foreign direct investment, we began to build new infrastructures that are, well, comparable with those found in other developed countries. Now, the building of infrastructure is it in itself a job-creating uh, business. Uh, we develop uh, people who have great skills in building uh, public facilities, and so the country became better connected with new roads, expressways, railways, we have ports and airports, and all these things created jobs, skilled jobs for our people. But at the same time, Malaysian contractors were developed, acquired a lot of skills, and they were able to go abroad to offer their, their work to other countries, which helped with the development of Malaysia. Now, when you build infrastructure such as roads, railways, and uh, ports, and airports, you attract a lot of people who see in these facilities opportunities for new development, for industries, for example. Now, when the expressway was built, from the south to the north, about 800 kilometers, all along the, this express, expressway, we see new towns growing, we see new settlements, new industries located all along the highway, making use of the highway in order to commute to the cities or to other places. And of course, the goods that they produce can be transported to the nearest port or airport, and this uh, contributes towards the development of uh, Malaysia. Now, up to that point, I think uh, it is still the simple process of uh, developing the country. But now, there came these new technologies. IT, for example, was introduced, developed, and we find that the speed of work can be speeded up by using information technology in the processing of uh, various government jobs for the people. Now, we, in order to facilitate this, we created what is known as the Multimedia Super Corridor. 
uh, which links Kuala Lumpur City with the international airport and the new administrative center in between. Now this stretch of about 50 miles from the city to the airport is designated as the multimedia super corridor wherein certain privileges are accorded to industries which are based on IT. So a lot of people found this place um, well equipped with uh, all the infrastructure for research and development. A whole new city was built known as Cyberjaya, which uh, houses all the new industries uh, which are IT based. And uh, they also become very big inf processing centers for a lot of work being done by banks all over the world. So the character of the industries in Malaysia began to change. But nevertheless, the whole object must always be to create jobs for the people, to get them to have better pay, and to develop the country infrastructurally so that people have a better quality of life. Uh, this has been attempted by Malaysia, and today we see a lot of uh, expressways cross, cross, crisscrossing the, the country. We have good airports, ports, and other infrastructure needs such as power and water supply. All these have been made possible because by developing economically the country, the government makes, uh, was able to accumulate more funds for building infrastructure. Now we have in Malaysia a policy which was copied from Japan. As you know, Japan was, com was condemned because of Japan Incorporated. Because in Japan, the public sector works well with the private sector. They seem to be helping the private sector achieve success. We thought that it is not a bad thing for the public sector to work with the private sector. After all, the public sector makes its money from the pri private sector. And so we introduced Malaysia Incorporated. Now in Malaysia Incorporated, the government is told to work closely with the private sector to make sure that the private enterprises do well and make a lot of profits. Now, why should we do this? Well, in Malaysia, the corporate tax was at one time 45%, but we reduce it to about 26% today. That corporate, corporate tax can only be collected by the government if the private sector makes money, makes profit. So when we help them, to, to be successful, to make profit, we were actually helping ourselves. And we told the public servants, you are not working for the private sector. You are working for yourself. If they pay the government more taxes, then we can pay you, give you better pay. And so the public sector cooperates well with the private sector, and this has enabled uh, private enterprise, investments from abroad to do well in Malaysia. And because of that, Malaysia became very attractive to domestic investors as well as foreign investors. So this is a policy which we try to keep up because uh, although it may lead to corruption and other things, but still the, the, the returns is worthwhile because when the private sector succeeds and makes a lot of money, the government also collects a lot of taxes. And with these funds, the Treasury was able to finance the building of infrastructure and also raising the salary of the government workers. We studied, of course, uh, the way to raise funds for the government, one of which was or to reduce 
the expenditure by the government, one of which was, of course, to privatize. Privatize government companies and privatize government functions. The pri pri government companies have never been well run because the people do not have the passion, the dedication to the companies because even if they make a lot of profits, they are not going to get any of the profit. There is no ownership other than the government. But the private sector works for self, uh, for, for, for increasing their incomes and uh, profits. So they work better in business than does the government. And so we transferred to the private sector the uh, ro road building and ownership, uh, telecommunication, and uh, many other government functions were transferred to the private sector so that they can run these uh, companies and functions better, make more money, and the government in the end collects more corporate tax. So although we transferred this uh, function to the private sector, we were able to uh, sell and earn some money from, from the transfer. We collected more taxes from them. At the same time, we reduced the number of employees in the government and therefore they are paid. And we, we, we were able to shrink the government without affecting the services that are afforded to the public. So these are some of the things that we did, and we are constantly examining whether what we are doing is right or wrong, because something may be good for one period of time, but at other times it may not be so good. So the government is constantly looking at the administrative machinery the equipments and the policies of the government and wherever necessary, new ideas were introduced in order to enhance the performance of the public, public service and so help the private sector to contribute more towards the government and the nation. This has worked fairly well in Malaysia, but as you can see, it's not too high-tech. It is more concerned about giving the people a good life, improving the quality of their life, of course, and providing them with better facilities in terms of uh, transportation, in terms of communication, in terms of uh, their ability to to finance uh, their own education, etc. All these things have contributed towards Malaysia's growth. Uh, I don't think it is um, something too uh, novel or too uh, new, but they still represent some kind of uh, innovation. Uh, we also have to face. Um, we also have to face uh, changes. In, uh, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, we know that uh, the world is about pro proposing all kinds of new changes, some of which are good, but uh, our attitude is that whenever any suggestion comes from outside, we have to examine the motive. Uh, obviously, people don't propose something that uh, will not benefit them. It may benefit us or it may not benefit us, but surely it must benefit them. And so when uh, we talk about free trade, for example, and tra free trade agreements, we need to study them very carefully. And if we find that they are not too beneficial to Malaysia, uh, we would try to change, or if we cannot, we would well, we would refuse to enter into such agreements. So uh, foreign influence on our economy is uh, obviously there all the time uh, because we are a trading nation. We, our wealth is through trade and whatever changes in the trading practices 
of the world would affect us. Uh, you know, at one time, we were under pressure by people devaluing, certain people devaluing our currency, and we became poor. And we were told certain things by the World Bank and the IMF. We examined their advice. Uh, we always think that uh, uh, gratuitous advice uh, must be examined carefully because there must be some uh, uh, agenda behind. So, as a result, we examine the reasons why uh, our currency was devalued and uh, because we don't accept that, uh, we formulated our own way of dealing with this problem. So, whereas a country can be independent today, politically, nowadays it's uh, no longer really fully independent because economically we are always affected by what's happening outside the world, the new kind of thinking outside the world, and even politically now we find that we are under pressure to comply with certain to uh, comply with certain ideas about politics and being politically right. For this, as an independent country, we are not going to accept just what we are advised to accept. We have to think about our own interests and examine any proposals very carefully and, if necessary, reject them. Otherwise, we would modify them or if they are really good for us, we would accept them. So it the development of a country and a civil service changes uh, because of the needs of an independent country. The needs of a colonial territory are different from that of the needs of, a, of an independent country. And fortunately for us, we inherited a good uh, administrative infrastructure and we were able to build on it taking into consideration our needs and the changes in the, our surroundings. I thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Mahathir. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give another round of applause for Dr. Mahathir. Our second keynote speech will be on the same subject. So once again, here's Mr. Yoon to introduce our second speaker, Minister Brendan Howland. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Brendan Howland, Minister of Public Expenditure and Reform of Ireland. He has played a crucial role in spreading the importance of transparency and accountability in public governance. Since his appointment in 2011, is doing a fantastic job of leading the ministry, the government body that has the expertise and the focuses on public service reform, which of course is the center of today's discussions. As a leader, he has been able to bridge the gap between the government and its citizens by providing public service reform. Minister Howland's efforts have not only served to improve the efficiency of public service delivery, but has also restored island economic sovereignties. Before his position as the minister, he has held several senior government portfolios, such as the Minister for Health and Minister for the Environment, as well as the Deputy Speaker for the Irish House of Parliament. Please give a warm welcome to the Minister Brendan Howland. Your Excellencies, Minister Kang, colleague ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to thank the United Nations and the government of the Republic of Korea for the opportunity to be here today and to speak to this distinguished gathering about Ireland's public service reform and political reform agenda and the role that they have played in the ongoing economic 
recovery in our country. While I will be addressing developments in, in Ireland, I believe that many of you involved in planning and providing public services will have shared similar experiences uh, in each of your own countries. That's why this event and the themes of this event are so important for all of us. We're all trying to deliver the best quality service for the people of our respective countries. We all endeavor to do so as efficiently as possible and to ensure that we deliver to our people value for money. And we all need to learn from one another, from our successes, and perhaps more importantly, from our failures. That's how we improve our public services, by sharing innovative approaches to service delivery and by cooperating across nations in areas of mutual interest. For example, I know that Ireland has benefited enormously from our engagement with the OECD over the years, as well, of course, as our involvement in the United Nations itself, where we have developed relationships with a broad range of international experts who are willing to share their experience and their wisdom on a range of issues. I should also stress the positive impact that Ireland's participation in the European Union has had on our development uh, over the last number of decades, both socially and economically. And I'll speak shortly of the support that the European Union and that the IMF has given us during the last few years of our economic recovery. As I'm sure many of you gathered in this room know, Ireland's economy suffered a serious setback in 2008 and 2009, partly due to global economic downturn and banking failure, and partly, I think it's fair to say, as a result of domestic planning failures. Our economic situation meant that tax revenues collapsed, and at the same time, demands and pressures on public services increased dramatically. Increased unemployment meant that there was great pressure on our social welfare uh, provision. Economic and demographic factors also meant that there was unprecedented new demand on our health and on our education systems at the same time. In November 2010, with the state's ability to borrow on the international markets seriously diminished, the then Irish government agreed to a program of financial support for Ireland from the European Union and from the International Monetary Fund. The objectives of the program were to put Ireland's economy back on a sustainable path, to stabilize the public finances and to create jobs again while protecting the most vulnerable and the poor from the effects of the economic downturn. I'm pleased to say that Ireland exited that support program, that EU IMF program of financial support, last December. Our exit from the program is a result of the commitment and the determination of the Irish people to recognize the set of problems we had to face and to get the job done. The program has met its key objectives, namely to put public finances back on a sustainable path, to restore the financial sector and the banking system to viability and sustainability, to restore Ireland to financial market funding, and we went from being able to borrow money at unaffordable rates three years ago to this, this week, in fact, 
been able to borrow money at a rate lower than the United States, and also to raise growth and jobs potential. So I can report to this conference that the Irish economy is well on the road to recovery. The public finances are under control. The banking system has been restructured and is now well capitalized. And more importantly, jobs are being created. Ireland's unemployment rate still stands at 11.8%, but that's down from a peak of 15.1% at the end of 2011. Obviously, this is unconscionably high, and we are continuing our focus on getting jobs created. In fact, this year has been declared by my government as the year of jobs, and we're determined to have an unemployment rate of 10% by next year and full employment by 2020. Our tax revenues at the end of May showed an increase of 5.6% on the same period last year, ahead of the profile of targets we've set, and the signs are very positive. Bringing the public finances into line has obviously been hugely difficult. No politician, no elected representative ever relishes increasing taxes and cutting public spending. But I believe that we've done the right thing. We've taken responsibility and we've shown maturity on the path to recovery. Since the height of the crisis, in 2009, we've made adjustments in revenue and expenditure that total more than 30 billion euro, and we've cut public spending by 13 and a half percent. It was clear to us that in the light of this expenditure consolidation and on the increased demand on public services, that significant strategic and sustainable reform of the Irish public service was essential if we were to continue to deliver and improve services that were demanded by our citizens. As such, public service reform has been a key element of the government's economic strategy since the beginning of the economic crisis. On taking office in 2011, we established a new bespoke dedicated department of public expenditure and reform, integrating the management of expenditure and the reform agenda for the first time. We now have a much smaller public service. In overall terms, the number of staff working in the public sector has decreased by more than 10% in the last few years. With regard to public sector pay, the public service exchequer pay and pensions bill has been reduced from its peak in 2009 by 22%. This has been achieved through a number of pay measures and by a reduction in the number of people working, as I've said, in the public service. The government's first public service reform plan, published shortly after we came to government in 2011, provided the basis for the most significant program of reform since the foundation of the Irish state. Since then, good progress has been made in terms of reducing costs, greatly improving productivity, more digital delivery of services, de the development of shared services, and putting in place a structure of public sector procurement reform and property asset management, to name just some of the areas that we've tackled. We've now embarked on a renewed second wave of reform as set out in the government's new public sector reform plan 2014-2016, which I published in January. This new reform plan outlines the key cross-cutting and sectoral reform initiatives that will be implemented over the next three years, as well as addressing our broader ambition for reform towards 2020. As the first phase of public service reform program was devised against the backdrop of the fiscal crisis, it was of necessity focused on the need to consolidate and reduce costs, to take out duplication, eliminate waste, 
and improve expenditure controls. As we reach now a more sustainable fiscal position, this new phase of reform has an ambitious goal of reforming the public service to have positive outcomes from all stakeholders, including citizens, businesses, and of course, public servants themselves. We're implementing an initiative aimed at the renewal of our civil service, which provides a leadership role at the center of the public service, as well as delivering important services itself. This will include a series of reforms to enhance accountability and performance within the civil service. Our reform program has been underpinned by two agreements which this government negotiated with the public sector unions. Critically, these agreements voted on by all public servants and agreed in a ballot of all public servants provide a framework for widespread industrial peace and stability, ensuring a suitable delivery platform for the existing public service reform program and supporting the next wave of reforms. One of the most important aspects of the agreements is the opportunity to deliver an unprecedented increase in productivity. The various productivity and reform measures, when fully implemented, will add almost 15 million additional working hours in the public service. Alongside our public service reform program, we're also implementing a series of reforms designed to build public trust in administration and in, polit in politics itself through greater openness, more accountability, as well as improved decision-making capacity. The extension of our ombudsman's powers came into effect last year, resulting in the most significant expansion in the power and jurisdiction of our ombudsman that has happened in more than three decades. Provision of detailed legislative framework to allow parliamentary uh, inquiries have been enacted to, to make sure that parliament holds public administration to account. Legislation for the regulation of lobbying so that people know who is lobbying whom and to what effect is currently before Parliament. And the introduction of legislation protecting whistleblowers will shortly be enacted by Parliament. This key reform of our anti-corruption framework provides comprehensive protections to whistleblowers in all sectors of the economy, both public and private. Extensive reform of our freedom of information legislation will extend it to almost all public bodies. In tandem with the drafting of this legislation, work is advanced so that when the, the Act becomes law, a new standard code of practice to support its implementation will be introduced across all bodies and public departments of state. An overhaul of our le ethics legislation is being progressed, aimed at supporting and promo promoting ethical conduct, creating an environment in which ethical and conflicts of interests are managed effectively and quickly, and unethical conduct is, is not only discouraged but eliminated. My department is also leading Ireland's participation in the Open Government Partnership, which serves to complement the existing objectives and provides an important international component to complement our national reform efforts. The intention is that Ireland will become a full member of the OGP in the coming weeks, and recently we've hosted the European OGP conference in Dublin. As part of our efforts to improve and open the budgetary decision-making process, we've implemented a series of budgetary reform measures. A new medium-term expenditure framework, setting out multi-annual ceilings for each Department of State on a rolling three-year basis has already been implemented. The amount of information in the annual estimates provided to Parliament has been substantially increased. A new spending code has been introduced to ensure that both current and capital expenditure are subject to rigorous value for money appraisal in advance of any money has been expended. An effective and efficient public service can provide an environment that enables economic growth and employment creation. 
the performance and reputation of public institutions is also a critical factor contributing to a country's competitiveness and a country's attractiveness uh, to foreign uh, direct investment. And of course, greater efficiency reduces the need for taxes to fund public services. As we embarked on our public service and political reform program, we were conscious that the reforms we make and are making are not merely about making short-term cost savings. It's imperative that we take long-term uh, measures, both in ensuring that our public services is fit for purpose today, but also it is strategic and flexible to allow for it to respond for future shock and future challenges. We must also ensure that we continue to develop our capacity for evidence-based decision-making in terms of how we plan. The objectives of public planning should, should be to ensure positive outcomes for service users, both citizens and businesses, over the long term. We're also building our capacity for innovative approaches to public service delivery, looking at new funding models and cooperation with both the private and the voluntary sectors to deliver services. Ireland's public service of the future will be smaller, it will be less expensive, it will need to be smarter and more flexible. It will embrace change as a constant and will ensure that we continue to improve our public services in a way that's both progressive and sustainable. And as I mentioned at the start, there is enormous potential for us to share our experiences and innovations. But there are obviously great differences in the circumstances faced by each of the different countries gathered at this forum. There is also an awful lot that we have in common. So on that note, I wish all of you the best for the coming days. I think it's fair to say that this event presents us with a real opportunity to share learning and to build relationships that will help all of us to work together to achieve our common goals, which are to develop the best possible public services and to ensure that public administration facilitates sustainable development. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Please show your appreciation to Minister Brendan Howland. And with that, we conclude the opening ceremony and keynote speech session of the 2014 UN Public Service Forum. Next is the exhibition tour for which VIPs will move first. May I ask the rest of our delegates and participants to remain in their seats for just a moment while our VIPs move first. And following the tour, there will be a reception for VIPs at the second floor VIP room one. And I have a very important announcement concerning lunch. The luncheon will take place at noon to the hall on my left, on my right rather, that's hall 6A from noon to 1.30 p.m. So we have about 40 minutes before the luncheon and I would encourage you to tour the exhibitions. The Public Service Innovation Exhibition is taking place in hall 6 which is to your right, and the Korea Culture and Tourism Promotion Booth and Korea's Contemporary Art Exhibition is taking place in the lobby. So we hope you'll take about the 30 minutes that we have left before lunch to enjoy the exhibitions and then join us for the lunch. After the luncheon, the roundtable discussion will begin at 1.30 p.m. right here, so please be in your seats by 1.30. Before you exit the hall, please make sure to leave your interpretation receivers on your seats. Once again, thank you very much for participating in the opening ceremony of the 2014 UN Public Service Forum. 감사합니다. Thank you very much.